On estimating uh, the livestock uh, production cycle in Akmola Oblast, uh, our title today is inter Determining Initial Stocking Rates for Beef Cattle Production. Here is a quick uh, overview of the different sections we're going to be going today through. Uh, introduction to determining initial stocking rates, forage availability, initial stocking rates, supplemental feed, drought mitigation preparedness, and then conclusions. The Akmola Oblast has about 300 to 400 millimeters of precipitation uh, annually. It's fairly evenly distributed with slightly higher amounts of precipitation in the summer months as illustrated by this graphic. Vegetation uh, across this oblast is generally grasslands and croplands. There is very few uh, mixed forests. Uh, those are in the mountainous regions uh, that are not included within this oblast. So the dominant vegetation then is suitable for livestock production, specifically beef cattle. The core and the central element that we're trying to get across in all of these presentations is we first need to establish what is the above ground net primary productivity. Another way of stating that is what is the amount of standing biomass that is produced above ground each year. That serves as the forage resource or the feed for the livestock during the growing season. The image here on the left, uh, we have broken down into different classes of vegetation. Uh, and this term stability is actually referencing how consistent the vegetation production is year to year over this time period from 2001 and 2014. As you see, the unstable sparse vegetation is in the western side of the obelisk, where it tends to be a little bit drier and more variability in precipitation. The densest vegetation that is most stable and most highly productive is kind of in the center part of the country, illustrated by the dark green. The coefficient of variation then of ANPP, which is the above ground net primary productivity, and the three classes are indicated then into risk for grazing capacity. So the variation annual precipitation drives the annual net primary productivity. So the red zones in the southwestern side of the obelisk have the highest coefficient of variation, or another way of saying that is the most variation in low production to high production over this 15 year period. And therefore, your stocking rates are not going to be consistent, but they should vary yearly than to match the annual net primary productivity. This is really the foundation of why later in the presentation, we talk about drought mitigation and an adaption process to allow for this variation that occurs naturally and still have stable production of beef from your ranch and not do any harm to your ranch resources The procedure for determining appropriate initial stocking rates consists of the following. As I said earlier, how much forage is required by the type and class of grazing animal in the area of interest? So what does the animal need to eat? 
Second thing, how much total st standing biomass is produced? The above ground net primary productivity. That will vary by plant community and its current state. What is the amount of standing biomass is actually foraged? That is what can be consumed by the animal in its preferred diet. Not everything that is grown is actually for each. There are poisonous plants that we cannot assume are edible. There are vegetation, uh, certain shrubs that livestock will not eat, beef cattle, so they are not for each. Our grasses and our forbs then make up the balance of their diet. The general rule of thumb used in the United States and often around the world is that 50% of the above ground biomass that is forage can be consumed annually. Now we've actually recommended that be reduced to 35% of the above ground standing biomass. And one of the reasons for that is, is we don't have the long-term historic background of production here and its ability to uh, sustain grazing year in and year out. So this is a conservative assessment that allows us to have a stocking rate established. And then over time, we can change that coefficient from 35% to 40 to 45 to 50, based on how we see the vegetation is responding to grazing. And this will allow us to increase stocking rates over time, if justified, without doing any harm to the ecosystem. It's much easier to increase stocking rates than it is to decrease stocking rates and have an economic uh, impact then by having less cattle to sell. How long, when, and type of grazing animals that will be in the pasture. For our example, uh, based on our conversations when we were in Kazakhstan, the typical growing season is approximately 210 days. It will begin in April and end maybe in late September or October, depending upon weather each year. We need to worry about water availability, the quality and the distance of water that the animal has to walk uh, every day while it's out there grazing. The topography is very important when setting stocking rate and specifically the slope of an area that's grazed. Livestock can walk up 50% slopes, although it's not very effective in grazing and often leads uh, incised trails from trampling that can then cause soil erosion. So we'll talk about discounting uh, our stocking rate to adjust for water availability and also to adjust for slope. We then also are concerned about the annual weather, which includes precipitation, temperature, humidity, and wind, because those affect livestock performance. Very hot, dry days, the animals will require more water than on cool, uh, moist, humid days. And then we also then try and do our inventory, which we talked about two weeks ago, identify all non-forage species and specifically information on poisonous and invasive plant species so that we can uh, make sure the livestock are not harmed or the ecosystem is not harmed by allowing invasive plants to establish and then expand. In Akmola, uh, we have defined right now a prototypic ecological site description. The historic plant community, to the best of our ability to identify, is a stipa grassland with diverse perennial grasses and shrubs. We call that number one, or HPC, historic plant community. We have seen evidence that of non-grazing for long time periods. This results in a decadent plant community with excess litter on the soil surface, 
and excess dead standing biomass. You actually lose productivity in this case when you do, do not utilize this ecosystem. That would be plant community two in the upper right hand corner. With grazing pressure that's a little bit higher than desired, you will start to see a shift in your plant community. The stipas will be removed or reduced and the festuca grasses will start to increase. And you'll also see an increase in the Artemisia shrubs. That's represented by plant community number three. With continued heavy grazing pressure, you'll start to see a removal of even stipa out of the plant community. It will disappear. Festuca, that, that grass will decrease in its abundance and its productivity. And the Artemisia uh, semi-shrub wormwood will start to increase. If grazing, and that is state four, each one of these numbers we call states in the ecological site. With continued severe overgrazing, we end up in state five with tremendous amount of bare ground. Almost all grass plants have been removed from this ecosystem. And what is left then is the Artemisia uh, shrub and very few forbs. So the fundamental question then is, if you end up in state four or five, can you restore it to a desired plant community with increased livestock production potential? We have seen cases in Kazakhstan where you have seeded uh, and interseeded with crested wheatgrass and agripyron uh, desert tortum or agripyron cristatum and successfully increased production. So yes, it can occur. Uh, but during that process, you typically then, after you've seeded it with the rangeland drill, you may have to wait one to three years for that vegetation to fully establish and become resistant to grazing. And then you can graze again. So this is kind of the fundamental process that we're talking about here for the Akmola obelisk. Uh, and there are different ecological sites, but they will follow a similar pattern where you'll have a historic plant community. Uh, and then if you overgraze it, you will lose uh, your livestock carrying capacity. And in some cases, the ecological uh, interruption in, live, in plant production is so severe that you have to have human intervention then to restore it. Simply removing livestock will not result in uh, expedient revegetation of the site. We can see that then in some of the virgin land program areas that were uh, broken out of rangelands, planted in wheat, uh, and then that was abandoned. And 30 and 40 years later, you still see a stunted plant community that hasn't returned totally to the historic plant community. So, how do we get going then on estimating stocking rates? We use remote sensing as Dr. Chi showed yesterday then to estimate the seasonal uh, growth of biomass and the total biomass. We combine that then with field-based techniques to estimate standing biomass and that proportion of the biomass that is forage. Use your field-based data then to validate and calibrate calibrate the remote sensing image. Dr. Chi went over that in quite detail last week. Field data collection. We went over this in uh, seminar two. We look at the standing biomass by life form, grasses, forbs, shrubs, cacti, tree, sedges, and rushes. We use a plant census to determine which plants are forage which plants are non-forage plants. We determine the plant height to determine if it is accessible to livestock. 
in most of Akmola, uh, the vegetation that we saw across that entire obelisk is reachable by livestock. We look at the foliar and ground cover uh, of the plant material to determine risk to soil erosion and health of the plant community. And we look at the soil surface characteristics to assist on validating remote sensing image and biomass potential of a site. Estimating style standing biomass, uh, we use these tools. Uh, they're very limited uh, and very inexpensive uh, to actually measure standing biomass. Uh, and we went over that in lecture two. So basically we use a tape measure, uh, stretch it out 100 meters in a cross formation. We establish then uh, vegetation cover by walking that and estimating the cover by looking straight down by dropping a pin. After we've completed canopy, uh, foliar and ground cover measurements, then we go ahead and clip uh, one meter square plots at fixed distances down that transect then to get a standing biomass. And we sort that then into classes of vegetation. By species, uh, if we can identify the species, if not, then by life form type. We also then would take a soil sample so we can correlate the soil series to the plant community to help us understand its production potential. And also then to document if there's been serious degradation on the site, if we've lost the A horizon or the surface horizon of the soil surface, or if through extensive overgrazing, you may have actually reached a compaction layer which will impact root production. We also then use a clinometer or other approaches to measure the slope. As I said earlier, in most of Akmola, slope was not a concern. The approach to establishing the macro plot, which is 100 meters by 100 meters on a specific site, to estimate sustainability and initial stocking rate can be found in these documents. We have put together a uh, supplemental uh, series of publications uh, that Go GOLNAS can make available after uh, this presentation. So all of these documents that you'll be seeing today are in the supplemental files, either from today's presentation or from earlier ones during this series. So the key ones are then the monitoring manual that actually go through the technical mechanisms of how to establish a monitoring system. And then two of the USDA's and the Department of Interior's uh, reference documents on how they collect and assess vegetation. The macro plot then is 100 meters by 100 meters. It's a circle. And we use that then divided into quarters. And in each of those quarters, we walk and do a complete plant census, trying to identify every species by its abundance class. This allows us then to try and determine percent forage availability. We use five different classes when we're doing our abundance or species richness identification. Uh, they are one to 10, 11 to 100, 100 to 500, 500 to 1,000, or greater than 1,000 plants in each quadrant. This just illustrates then uh, the forms that we use in paper uh, to con collect the census. Each set of forms we use is also presented uh, in the supplemental material. Uh, so you can use directly uh, in English the forms that we're using. 
This would be an example after we've collected the data and processed it. Uh, for each transect then, we would list every plant that we identified, its life form, classify it to its forage value uh, and availability. We have identified uh, poisonous plants uh, in Kazakhstan. And in this case, it's Linaria vulgaris, uh, and its frequency was 12 plants. Forage availability will vary by livestock species. Goats and sheep will browse shrubs that beef cattle would not normally consume. Non-forage for beef cattle is typically defined as woody stems of shrubs, plant heights above where the livestock can reach, vegetation that is too low that can't, cattle cannot access it, or is unpaddle, unpalatable and the cattle will not eat it. Non-forage must be determined for each species of livestock if a mixed herd of grazing animals is occurring in the pasture simultaneously. And we saw many examples of where on a ranch there might be horses, beef cattle, and sheep all grazed in the paddock at the same time. Therefore, you have to be able to, when you're doing your biological survey for forage, identify it for each of the livestock species and then calculate uh, it differently for each animal. So you might have uh, certain shrubs that sheep eat that horses would not. And so we can show you at the end of the presentation then how we can calculate stocking rate in an Excel spreadsheet where we can take that into account. So on forage availability, uh, we are worried about uh, plant cover. So what we do then is we lower the pin straight down as illustrated in the uh, second image. And the first time we hit a plant, we record it. Uh, any type of hit on the plant, whether it's the stem or a leaf is recounted as a foliar hit. Then you lower the pin all the way to the soil surface and you classify the ground soil surface by the following classes, litter or organic material that's on the soil surface, rock fragments, bedrock, bare ground, biological soil crust. You would also then uh, identify if you have the basal area of the plant. Although most people, uh, would know this, uh, we did put a slide in here then just to define our classes. So in the upper left-hand photo is a tree. Lower stature uh, woody biomass we call shrubs. The purple flowering uh, plant in the upper right-hand corner is a cactus. Uh, grasses, forbs, are shown in the lower right-hand corner. Agave or yucca uh, is shown in the left-hand corner. As we get later into our last presentation, and we talk about wind and water erosion as a way of looking at sustainability. Uh, we group then agaves into our shrub categories. And that's why I'm breaking this out now so that when we get to next week and we start talking about uh, wind and water erosion, uh, we use life form classes of plants and we have aggregated those into different classes. So it's important that we all understand uh, our definition of these different types of plants. So as I stated earlier, the foliar cover is the first hit on any plant. Basal area, which is a ground cover term, is indicated there, right where that plant emanates directly out of the soil. We classify our grasses by different types of life form. 
uh, large, robust bunch grasses. Those are usually plants that are circular in nature uh, and reproduce from seeds. They have a different rooting structure. Their roots usually go down deeper in the soil. Uh, then the second class of vegetation, which is sod grasses. Uh, think of a football field, a soccer field, a golf course. Those are uh, actually planted to sod grasses. They typically will reproduce by stolons and rhizomes vegetatively and will uh, occur over the entire soil surface. And then you have your annual grasses. Uh, in this case, I'm showing cheatgrass in the bottom picture, which is native to Kazakhstan. Our ground cover types, uh, bare soil, rock, again, the basal area, and litter. We do see this in Akmola oblis. It is not very common on our visits, but biological soil crust, crust. We break that out as a special type of ground cover. Uh, those are your mosses, lichens, and algae that form uh, on your soil surface. We also have litter on the soil surface. And litter is broken plant material that is laying on, directly on the soil surface, but it also includes uh, animal feces. Uh, it could be cow manure, uh, could be rabbit manure. We would call that litter in our classification. A rock then is defined as something that is larger than two millimeters. Anything below two millimeters, we call bare soil. So to go through this then, uh, here is our instructions and the uh, field worksheet then for clipping biomass. So we actually get a uh, estimate then in this pasture. So we clip five one meter plots to determine standing biomass at a fixed distance down the transect. They are either 15, 55, and 85 meters from zero on transect one, or 15 and 85 meters at transect two. We typically would use a one meter square circular plot. Uh, and the reason for a circular plot is it has the least amount of surface area versus a square. So you have less boundary areas where you have to make decisions in using a circular plot than a rectangle or a square plot. After we're done clip, clipping all the biomass, then at the center of the X, we dig a quick soil pit down to 50 centimeters. We take a picture of that pit for our records. We then identify the soil by horizons. How many horizons are they down by depth? Th those can be differences by soil texture, by the aggregates, uh, stability, uh, and other things. I have provided uh, four or five references in the supplemental material on how in the United States we sample soil. We also collect all the litter off the soil surface and bag that. We take soil texture from the surface about two centimeters and bring that back to the laboratory for analysis. We will do soil on that soil. Then we will do organic matter or what you call humus we will identify the color of the soil, surface soil. We use that in remote sensing. Also, the darker the soil, typically we have more humus in the soil, so it indicates uh, its health. And we'll do the pH of the soil.
we measure the plant height. Uh, here are our instructions of how we do that. And we do that consistently across the transects at fixed intervals as indicated here. We use plant height then as supplemental infor information to help us determine the percent of the pasture that has been grazed. So we don't, there is not a good statistical relationship between plant height and standing biomass. But if you're familiar with your plant community and you're measuring plant height over time, it does give you an indication that the plant community has been seriously grazed if it's very low in stature or if you see the seed heads uh, and the, it's at its normal height, it tells you that it's been very lightly grazed or not grazed at all. It's kind of a reference check we use then when we're sampling at different times of the year to give us a percentage of the standing biomass that has been re removed to date if we're doing just a one-time sample period. This allows us to do a reconstruction then on sta total standing biomass that should have occurred in the pasture. These are all documented in detail in the documentation on sampling strategies that I showed earlier, uh, but we're not gonna go through that process today in detail. So, now we're getting, now that we've measured our biomass, we're gonna get into how to actually estimate initial stocking rates. The default utilization, as I said earlier, is generally established at 50% of the annual forage production. However, grazing animals also damage plants by trampling them. They can alter uh, plant selection by defecating or urinating on them. Uh, other animals, uh, insects will consume biomass uh, like grasshoppers or locusts or ground squirrels or marmots. Ants can remove standing biomass uh, and vegetation. So to account for this, and as I said earlier, to start with a conservative es estimate, uh, we will reduce the amount of standing biomass that we consider available for forage consumption to 35%. This gives us a conservative estimate. If you're monitoring your pastures every year and after three or four years, you see that you have a healthy stand with no decline in production, you can start systematically increasing your grazing efficiency from 35% to 50% as long as you're having average precipitation in the year or above average precipitation. This would allow you then to increase your stocking rate if you could purchase steers uh, and bring them onto your land. The approach that we use uh, for establishing forage consumption uh, requirements by livestock is based on the concept of an animal unit equivalent. That is based on a beef cow, a mother cow with a calf that is less than four months of age. We don't consider forage eaten by that calf less than four months to be significant. The weight estimate of that mother cow is 453.6 kilograms which equates to a thousand pound uh, mother cow. Methods to actually calculate the AUE or the animal unit equivalent depend upon how daily forage requirement is estimated by animal species. This will vary then somewhat by the age of the animal, the climate, topography, <coughs> health status, if the animal is pregnant, uh, the quality of the forage, water quality and water availability, and will all impact uh, the amount of forage required then to keep that animal alive on a daily basis. So 
for our estimation purposes, we use an AUE of 13.6 kilograms of dry forage per day for one mother cow and calf less than four months old. For every increase or decrease in weight of your, an of your target animal, then we increase or decrease the amount of forage required. So if you had a 10% increase in animal weight, that was an increase in animal by 400, by, excuse me, 45.36 kilograms, we would increase that forage requirement to 13.6 kilograms by 10%. In this case, you'd add 1.36 kilograms required to keep that animal alive. Here we show the table uh, that we utilize most commonly in the United States by different types of animals. So a cow with calf, we use a 1.0 animal equivalent. A bull that may weigh 40% more weight uh, than an animal or 25% more, we would adjust its AUM or it's animal unit equivalent, excuse me, AUE. If you're grazing steers, it may only be 80% uh, of the weight of that mother cow as you're still growing, you would use a 0.8. Sheep, uh, it takes five sheep to equal to one mother cow. And you can read the rest of them. So to actually calculate the available forage then, we use the uh, expression AF for available forage. Our units are gonna be kilograms per hectare per year. So we start with the above ground net primary productivity, ANPP. For our example, we will say that the site is producing 600 kilograms per hectare per year. We subtract out then the non-forage standing biomass. In this particular example, I use 785. Because as you can see over on the photo, uh, it might have a very low amount of standing grass biomass. We multiply that then by the grazing efficiency of 0 0.35. This should result in an available forage of 285 kilograms per hectare. To estimate how many mother cows then with calves less than four months could be grazed on a thousand hectare pasture for a grazing season of 210 days. And with our average forage production of 285 kilograms per hectare we're gonna use equation two. So you take the grazing area, which is 1,000 hectares, times available forage, 285 kilograms per hectare. Divide that by the number of days allowed, which was 210. And then multiply that times the daily feed intake in kilograms per day. In this case, when you do the mathematics, we would end up with NA, which is number of animals. We basically have our 100 cows that we could graze during this grazing se season. For a productive ranch, then in the United States, we estimate that it takes one bull for about 25 mother cows to impregnate them in a consistent manner. So in addition to these 100 cows, we would probably also need four bulls to five bulls, depending upon how uniform the vegetation is and the pasture. The flatter and more uniform the slope, the less bulls you need. If you have really rough, rugged terrain, 
then it takes more effort for those bulls to find the mother cows and impregnate them. So you might need five. So in this case, right now, with 1,000 hectares, we be potentially slightly overgrazing the area if we include the four bulls and the forage it needs with the assumption that the breeding season is during the grazing season, during the time period of April to October. So to estimate the daily water intake that is required for livestock is also part of our calculation of calculating the stocking rate. So that's gonna vary, as I said before, based on if the cow is, is just pregnant, if it's actually given birth and it's actively lactating, they're gonna have different requirements based on atmospheric temperature. If you have a bull, because of its increase in its mass, its body weight, it's gonna requ require more wa water in liters per day. For most of our examples, we're gonna use uh, approximately 40 liters per day as an average amount of water required for that mother cow. So if you had 100 cows, that would require 1.46 million liters of water for an entire year for your herd of 100 cows. Additionally, water is going to be required then for cleaning and maintaining the winter housing facilities. And you need to also calculate if this is freestanding water from a lake that you will have evaporation or you might actually have loss through infiltration out of your lake or stock pond. So additional water would need to be calculated. This becomes a key resource of concern. Then in Okmola, we saw areas that had excellent grazing potential, but there was limited water availability. So you have to then either reduce your livestock numbers to match the available water in your seasonal lakes and ponds, or you have to supply them with supplemental water. What we use in the United States then to try and address this water availability. So in an idealized situation, you would want water uh, within one kilometer. So the animals are not walking extensively during the day, especially if it's hot and start to dehydrate uh, themselves. This reduces their e forage efficiency into uh, cons making biomass or, or weight gains of the animal. At about three kilometers, we would reduce stocking rate then about 50%. Because uh, what will tend to happen is the livestock will concentrate around the water and they'll eat all that forage first. And then if left alone in a pasture situation without a herder directing them, they will overgraze consistently around that water source. There is generally across the world a linear distance away from water. As you go out, you will see less plant consumption with the greater distance of water. Once you get four or five, maybe six kilometers away from water, uh, you'll start to see very limited grazing if the livestock have free choice. So we reduce then the stocking rate by a percentage to account for this degradation around the water source. The second adjustment we need to take into account then is slope. Slopes between zero and 15%, we don't make any adjustment. The livestock don't seem to have any problem uh, utilizing those areas. As you get up to uh, 15 to 30% slope, we would reduce the livestock carrying capacity, the stocking rate to 70% because they're going to start degrading those hill slopes by walking uh, zigzag paths up the uh, hill slope. 
because uh, they prefer to do that than walking straight up the hill. And they won't be uniformly grazing across the, the landscape. Uh, when you get to 31 to 60 percent slope, we'll have a 40 percent adjustment and reduction. And when you get above 60 percent slope, we don't consider that forage is available to the livestock. Yes, they can graze it, especially goats or sheep uh, versus cows, but they start really having an adverse impact because they don't spread out uniformly across the area and you can have degradation. And then at 60% slope, if you start opening up the area because of overgrazing or these cattle trails or livestock trails, that allows for concentrated soil erosion which will further degrade that site. So then we add in these other coefficients. So to our equation that we used before, equation two. Again, we'll set this thing up with the common area, a 1,000 hectare pasture, the grazing area available forage at 285 kilograms per hectare. We'll have a drought coefficient, the D, that allows us to adjust for uh, variations in climate. Your water coefficient uh, for distance to water. In this hypothetical example, we said it was two kilometers to water. So we reduced uh, that to a 90% coefficient. We said slope was between zero and three. So we used a one coefficient, so no adjustment necessary. Same things in days of use, 210. And daily feed intake remained the same. So you see then we had a 10% reduction in f number of animals because of water availability. So our animals went to 89.8. So adjustments then in calculating stocking rate are suggested to account for climate variability, drought. An average annual production of forage given high variability in precipitation, a reserve of 40% increase in land may be recommended. So as you saw earlier in the first several slides I showed, there was a variation in precipitation that went from the northeast, which was the highest precipitation or, and least variation. In the southwest corner of the obelisk, we had higher variation in annual precipitation, more variability, which will directly translate into uh, variability in production. So if we're looking at setting up a brand new ranch, then one of the things we want to do then is develop a drought mitigation or adoption or adaptation plan. So, and we would adjust that drought adaptation plan then to the variability in production that we've seen using remote sensing over the last 20 years. The highest variation we saw was 40%. So we would add 40% more land uh, to have that as a reserve. So if we had one of those dry years, we do not have to immediately destock. If you have a wet year and you do not need that forage reserve, then you could hay it as supplemental hay and sell it or stockpile it then because hay can be reserved uh, for two or three years if kept under correct conditions. And that way when you have a drought year, then you have your forage resource. Also, most of the plants that we saw, these grass species, are what we call C3 grass plants. They use that photosynthet photosynthesis pathway the energy and nutrient content of the C3 plant cures pretty well in the above ground standing biomass. 
So you can use that standing biomass then again as a drought reserve forage. You never know when a drought is going to occur, but they do consistently occur. So for a typical mother cow, grazing for a 210 day period with no supplements, it is estimated that 2,856 kilograms per year per cow of forage is required for that grazing period. Now, we have a non-grazing season then of 155 days. So we need an additional 2,108 kilograms of hay to feed that cow during the winter confined period. So the total forage for a year is close to 5,000 kilograms per hectare per year for a cow. There is a third then aspect when you're looking at the entire oblast, and that is if we sell that calf at six months old and it goes to a feedlot, there needs to be additional forage hay and some other energy source like barley or wheat to feed that calf and fatten it up. So the main supplemental feed that we saw in the obelisk is barley. So we also noticed, and it's been reported in, in a lot of the literature, that some of the native grass hay has, is relatively high in fiber to its protein content, and this will slow down digestion. So cow can only eat about 1.5% of their body weight on low quality hay during the winter months. This also then impacts reproduction potential and their ability then to uh, deliver a live calf that's fully healthy. So we would recommend then that we use a winter supplement. In this case, we will use barley uh, during the winter months then to help increase uh, the nutrition of the feed that the animal is eating during the winter months. So you can consume up to 3% of their body weight today of hay. So you increase their hay consumption, their weight gain, your ability to produce milk then if they have a calf uh, by increasing this supplemental feed. You never want to, uh, during this winter feeding period, uh, feed them too much grain. We recommend no more, no more than a half a percent of the cow's body weight be fed on any day. We estimate that approximately one kilogram per day of barley as a supplement should be enough to sustain the animal in the non-grazing season in adequate health than to deliver a healthy calf and provide it with adequate milk. There are many other alternative rations than barley that can be fed uh, to the animal during the winter months. This table then, uh, which is in Russian, uh, shows you then the different types of forages uh, it's calcium content, it's phosphorus content, uh, and it's energy content. And so, you know, you could use cottonseed meal, uh, you could use fish meal. And so uh, we just use barley in our example because we noticed that it was readily available uh, in northern Kazakhstan. There are numerous software programs uh, that are available then that you can utilize to calculate a feeding ration during this winter period. So if you have tested your hay and you know it's energy and nutrient content, uh, the weight of the animal and its pregnancy status, then you can use one of these software programs uh, to estimate the amount and type of supplemental forage or supplement that would be necessary to keep it in in excellent health. 
calculating hay production needed for supplemental winter feed. So on this hypothetical ranch, we're saying that the, again, the animal the above ground net primary productivity in this case is 2000 kilograms per hectare. Uh, the percentage of hay harvested, we're gonna take 60% of the standing biomass, uh, multiply those two together, you would end up with 1,200 kilograms per hectare uh, of hay. So if you have 1.75 hectares of hay per cow is required for 155 day winter period, period you just basically make a simple division. You have 2,108 divided by 1,200. So it takes 1,705 hectares of hayland then during this 155 day period. How you stay, save the hay then becomes very important in keeping its energy and nutrient content. Uh, whether you use straw bales, uh, a typical uh, small bale here in the United States might be uh, 125 pounds. I show some examples uh, that we did see in Kazakhstan where hay was loosely collected and then carted uh, and stacked in mounds and then fed out that way. So then we calculate the total hay required during the winter period. So you have 155 days, it requires 13.6 kilograms per hectare. So we end up with 2,108 kilograms during this winter period. We're gonna need approximately one kilogram per day of supplemental feed. Uh, from the World Bank estimates uh, for this part of Kazakhstan, it was estimated that barley produced uh, at 1,200 kilograms per hectare per year. So you have days of use, 155 days during the winter confinement period, multiplied times one uh, kilograms per day feeding. So you need 155 kilograms uh, per cow. If you do the math then, uh, we produce 1,200 kilograms per hectare. You need 155 uh, kilograms. So it only takes 0 0.13 hectares of barley land uh, per cow. If we're using our 100 cow herd, then you would need 13 hectares of barley land to produce the supplemental feed during this winter month period. So we are calculating these different forage requirements then to keep your herd healthy for an entire year. Uh, the farm may actually not produce its own barley, uh, may not even produce its own hay because of lack of uh, equipment to plant and harvest both hay and barley. So they would have to purchase these resources. As we've said before, there's a large interannual variation in precipitation. So we have seen that the maximum over a 20 year time period was 40% between the highest produced uh, biomass on a specific uh, pixel from remote sensing to the lowest produced standing biomass. So we recommend that there's a drought mitigation plan be developed for each ranch. A simple approach then, if you're in the southwestern part of the country, would be using a 40% uh, coefficient where you'd have to increase then uh, the land, both for grazing during that 210 day period, increase the hay land required by 40% and increase your barley production by 40%. 
And this should give you at least a minimum of one year surplus grazing resources that if you hit a severe drought, you do not have to destock immediately. The other part of drought mitigation plan then is really looking at your water availability. So how are your livestock uh, reaching uh, water? Uh, one example of drought mitigation that could be done is you could uh, develop stock ponds. Uh, if you have a small ephemeral stream, you can dam up that stream, hold the water back, and that will provide you extra water than during the drought. Another way of doing that is digging a excavation pit or a dugout and allowing the water then to fill up. Again, that gives you surplus water uh, to go through the drought. If you put in stock ponds and you have channels, incised channels, that during heavy thunderstorms uh, flow water at high speeds, uh, they often will erode and downcut. By putting in this gully plug or stock pond, it will stop the uh, water flow, slow it down if it's designed as a detention pond, and therefore uh, reduce erosion offsite improve your water quality. It also allows you then to store water for use by livestock. There's a couple other things and you might want to consider uh, on water availability. Then if the livestock have complete access then to your stock pond or lake or reservoir, uh, they typically will trample it all down, uh, muddy it up. They may stand in the water, actually defecate and urinate directly in the water supply, contaminating it. So uh, one of the ways of addressing that then, if resources are available, is you fence around your stock pond and then you open up a very small area, you lay a concrete foundation, and then the livestock then enter into that confined area so that they're not trampling down the entire uh, water resource and causing excess degradation. So in order to calculate this, basically a rough rule of thumb would be you need four hectares of above ground drainage area for every surface acre of pond. Uh, now this is gonna vary substantially then uh, based on your precipitation uh, in the area. And next week then, when we use the rangeland hydrology and erosion model, it'll allow us to calculate runoff uh, from different storms uh, that occur historically and from that we can then gauge how many hectares we need, what slope we need, uh, then to uh, actually effectively build a stock pond and have a reliable water supply. You also then want to keep your livestock, if you have built a pond that has a dam spillway, you want to prevent them from grazing and walking on it. They will trample that and break down that and it increases the risk then for uh, the dam overtopping and breaking. Uh, lastly, then on your dam face, you want to keep shrubs, uh, trees off of that. Their roots will go down through the dam face and can create macro pores that allow water to go through it and uh, create piping and break it that way. You would also then want to remove any rodents uh, or animals that are tunneling if you're using an earthen spillway. Again, that would create potential breakage. One of the last things then uh, is manure management. Uh, we're not going to go over it in great detail, all the different ways of managing uh, manure, but just consider, and you're probably well aware of this, 
during that 150 day, five day winter period, uh, the animal, a hundred animals will produce a tremendous amount of manure. Uh, and that has to be handled appropriately or you can cause uh, non-point source pollution if that is stored in big piles, it rains, snow falls on it, it melts, that water then will leach nutrients out and can get into surface waters and cause problems. Uh, there are a series of tools that are available. Uh, I give it some examples here uh, that are available on the web uh, for looking at how you handle your manure and it will minimize then greenhouse gas emissions uh, to the atmosphere from your nitrates uh, and your noxes. It'll also then eliminate uh, or help you manage uh, runoff so that you don't contaminate surface water. In general then, a beef cow can generate between six and 26 kilograms of manure per day. Uh, and so that's quite a lot of manure. Uh, so during a 155 day period, you could have 4,000 kilograms of manure uh, per animal. In addition to that, a beef cow can generate up to 13 liters of urine per day. And that depends upon its diet, uh, the temperature, if walking on open rangelands or in a confined area. That could result in up to 2,000 liters of urine per day. Uh, again, that is a source of uh, pollution potential uh, that should be managed. So if we look at the resources and byproducts from a 100 cow herd in Okmola, in this case, we used an annual net primary productivity of 3,000 kilograms uh, with forage availability of 2,500. Uh, so we had 500 kilograms that was not forage. Uh, so we had 100 hectares uh, of grazing resource. We would need winter hay, 175 hectares of hay land available. Uh, if we were actually harvesting and making hay from this same area that we were grazing. Winter supplement, you need about 33 hectares of barley. Uh, your drought reserve, your total land base then would be about 1,700 hectares of land. You need about 146 million liters of water during the year. Uh, plus some additional then if you're washing your barns and other areas. And you could produce 400,000 kilograms of manure and 200,000 liters of urine. So here we'll take an example then of calculating the resources and stocking rates of a mixed livestock herd. And in this case, we're gonna say that the property is 2000 hectares and we're still producing 3000 kilograms per hectare today of above ground net primary productivity. We started with 175 cows. We calculate we need eight bulls. We have 53 calves that are older than six months we're retaining, 25 horses, 100 sheep, for a total of 361 animals. Your total annual production then is 3,000. Non-forage is 500, so your forage production is 2,500 kilograms per hectare. We did not have to adjust for slope. We did not adjust for water. We had good water access. Again, the pasture size is 2,000 hectares. Days in the pasture is calculated at 210. Now we start going through sustainable forage consumption. We said it was 50%. We added a deduction for the grazing efficiency at 
So our grazing coefficient is 0 0.35. So the annual available sustainable forage for consumption then is 875 kilograms per hectare. You produce over 1,750,000 kilograms of forage then uh, available for consumption off your 2,000 hectare place. Your forage demand uh, by animal is nearly 5,000 kilograms. And then your annual de demand for the days in the pasture is nearly 3,000 for a cow. And you can go through each one of the animal types. And then we have a ranch total over on the right hand side. So our animal demand by animal type for the herd is 868,000. Daily forage demand is over 2,000 kilograms. Days available for by animal type. You can go through, we've broken it down by each species. And you end up then the estimated sustainable stocking rate by pasture as you go down, the amount of supplemental feed that's going to be required, and over in the right hand side you start to see our totals. So, whoops, this one did not get translated into Russian, I apologize. So management adjustments, then a practice use is, is herders. Uh, and you go from uh, a central confined area where you overnight the animals, you take the animals out during the day, they water and graze, and you bring them back at night. The use of this central facility limits the number of animals that can be sustainably grazed due to the distance they can travel in a day. It also increases uh, trailing across the landscape potentially and could uh, result in increased soil erosion and invasive plants in the bare interconnected animal trails. Water access distance to water and quality is a significant consider consideration when establishing initial stocking rates to ensure sustainable grazing practice. Water requirements during the grazing period is approximately 806,000 uh, liters and about 600,000 liters during the winter months. Forage for the ranch that was designed in a circle with a two kilometer radius from a central facility would have 12.57 kilometers squared area or 1,257 hectares for grazing. If we start to go through our calculations where we said that median annual net primary product production is 2,500 kilograms per hectare 35% forage consumption rate, 0.6 drought coefficient, 0.8 non-forage coefficient, no adjustments for slope or distance to water, or distance to water, excuse me, is 0.9. Forage demand for seven months is 2,856 kilograms per cow. Result is approximately 96 cows that could be sustainably grazed using this type of system. And on site hay production to feed during the winter. Additional land would be necessary then if you're growing your supplemental feed on site. If we implement a rotational grazing system, that will alter the time of year 
when the area is grazed and provide opportunity for vegetation to reproduce. So for a 210 day grazing period, each of the three pastures would be grazed for 70 days. One pasture would be rested for the year. This provides forage during the drought if necessary by grazing that resting period. This would be an example then of how we'd set it up. So you have a four pasture in year one. You would graze the first 70 days in pasture one, then move to two, move to three, pasture four is rested. In year two, you start in pasture two, that becomes your first one grazed. Then you move to pasture three, pasture four, then you rest your pasture one. And you just do that each year in a very simple rotational pattern. And this changes the time of year when the vegetation is consumed, allowing each pasture then to reproduce by seed uh, as you go through the four year cycle. So this just kind of shows you what I've been talking about, your drought. Uh, if you look at the different years, averaged over. Uh, so in 2001, uh, our stocking rate was estimated at 2.88. 2011 uh, required 3.95 hectares per year because of low production. Uh, the smallest was 2.23. So you have a high variability then in what is produced annually and how much forage then uh, land you need. And that's why we've introduced this concept of a drought reserve. So in our conclusions then, net annual primary production of forages, percentage of annual production, and amount of distribution of poisonous plants in the pasture. Water quality distribution and availability needs to be considered. Other things to be considered then is, does the ranch have access to farming equipment, labor? Is the land and the climate suitable for growing dryland hay and winter supplemental feed? Do you have to buy those resources if you cannot grow them on site? Do you have access to capital then if you're buying it? And then do you have adequate facilities to store and feed winter forage? Uh, instead of hay, you might want to consider then converting that cut forage into silage and feed that as your, sub, as, uh, your hay source during the winter months. You can also change barley to wheat or corn, uh, brewer's yeast. Uh, there are many sources of supplemental feed. So this is a generalized assessment of the livestock production potential of Akmola Oblast and how you would calculate it uh, on a ranch scale. The actual number of livestock that can vary will will depend on the method of grazing animals. Are you using a herder uh, to move them? Are you using a fenced pasture and they have free access? Are you using a timed grazing system where you have very narrow pastures uh, and you move the fence to, to drive the animal across the pasture? Uh, when you graze and where you graze and the type of animals and the number of animals, will all determine uh, what your sustainable stocking rate is. So other things we wanna uh, consider then when trying to estimate sustainable stocking then is the actual herd management. Uh, you do, do you have an animal identification system? Uh, ear tags, are you branding your livestock? What is your vaccination schedules? When is your calving and breeding season? Uh, that becomes important then when you're trying to sell your animal. Uh, do you have 
a fixed breeding, breeding season where you're trying to get all your livestock pregnant within a 30 day window. And then you have maybe a second 30 day window where you try and rebreed those animals. What is your decision then on keeping an open cow, a cow that does not get pregnant? Are you going to keep it for an entire year uh, for the next breeding season and then have to feed it all year with no production of a calf? Do you use, and the reason for using a, a, a confined breeding season then is you will calve at a centralized time. Uh, it makes it easier then to uh, vaccinate all your animals. Uh, you also then can sell your animals as a cohort. Uh, would be able to sell your herd maybe when they reach 600 pounds uh, all at once. Uh, do you semen test your bulls to determine that they're actually capable of impregnating the cows? Are you feeding mineral supplements and salts uh, blocks out there in the pasture then to help with animal uh, health, but also in distribution of the animals? What is your forage uh, resource, uh, your hay? What is the quality of that hay and how does it cure? And then you wanna worry about your weather variability. Okay, thank you. Uh, that kind of goes through this uh, organized presentation. Right now, I'm going to step out uh, of this program and then uh, bring up an Excel spreadsheet where we have examples uh, of this and we can take questions from you. We can manipulate the spreadsheet uh, and try different examples. Uh, so hold on just a second while I change the screen. Uh, Golnaz, do I have the right screen up now? Are you seeing an Excel spreadsheet? Yes, you do. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is in the supplemental materials uh, that uh, we provided to Golnaz then to make available to all of you. Uh, it's a very simple uh, Excel spreadsheet. I've got uh, a series of examples uh, that we'll go through. Uh, and talk about them and show you how to use the spreadsheet. Uh, as I said, it's a very simple spreadsheet. Uh, we did not put in error traps. Uh, so if you accidentally input the wrong number, you'll get a wrong answer. So uh, you need to be careful on what you're uh, putting in. So in the top, we give some general background information uh, as we've described. There's also a supplemental sheet, uh, a Word document that steps you through all the equations I just presented uh, in a written format. So you have that you can read uh, as background material. Uh, and then you can use the spreadsheet then to try and calculate a uh, sustainable stocking rate. So as we go through the left-hand side, uh, there is just some record managements. Uh, date we did this, the file name, the recorder, sampler, location, site, macro plot, ID, and pasture. Where did you get the information from? Uh, this would be uh, from all of the other stuff we talked about earlier about calculating your standing biomass. Uh, from your field, you'd record it here so you can have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Then you start talking about, uh, in the light green, your resources that will set up what we can graze. So what were you estimating uh, your total production to be? In this case, it was 2,000 kilograms per hectare. We estimated 500 kilograms of non-forage. So total forage available is 1,500. 
barley production we're going to assume is 1,200 uh, as an average. We go through then some of our coefficients. So what is a sustainable forage consumption? We set it at 50%. We adjust that then for grazing loss and efficiency, uh, our conservative factor. And so we'll use a grazing coefficient of 35% or 0.35. We've established the number of days in the pasture to be 210. Winter confinement 155. Days in a feedlot then would be 180 days. Uh, we then start to define our animal and our resource base. So you go through here, it says pasture size, we're going to use uh, 1,000 hectare pasture. Distance to water is 1.4 kilometers, so we're not going to uh, adjust our stocking rate. We'll use a coefficient of one. Slope is 3%, no need to adjust uh, forage availability, so we'll use a coefficient of one. We now are defining our desired herd distribution and the amount of animals. Uh, we have a cow and a calf, we'll have bulls, we'll have weaned cows, We'll keep some one-year-old replacement cows because we'll be selling some open cows or older cows. We have some sheep, the ewes, yearling sheep, the ram for breeding purposes, and horses on our ranch. Going down here, we will use the animal unit equivalent based on assumptions of biomass or mass of the animal. And that gives us our daily feed requirement by type of animal. Same thing for hay and same thing then for winter supplement. We move on then to the number of animals uh, by each class. Annual available sustainable consumption so that was 525 total production. And you can go through here all the way through. And it'll start to then break out what that class of livestock requires. So if you only had uh, cows and calf, you could have, we estimate that you could have 104 cows and calf on that thousand hectares. So you go over here then and you start then summarizing the calculation. So the herd during the grazing period uh, actually requires 74.12 uh, kilograms of feed per day for this herd size. Goes through here and it calculates uh, the annual forage demand for that herd, the hay demand, the winter supplement demand, it provides you an estimate then of during the grazing period, uh, how many hectares you needed uh, per individual animal, how many acres or hectares you need then to produce hay and supplemental forage. And you get over here in red. For this herd size, you actually would have needed 1,473 hectares. So you have actually been, you would overgraze your area by 40% using this herd. So we wanna try and balance this so if I go to the next tab, basically what we have done is we said, 
okay, how much forage does our land have to produce if we keep the exact same herd? And you can see I got it down to just a slight overgrazing, which is insignificant of uh, five extra hectares. In order to keep the exact same herd distribution, if we go up here, I had to increase the forage production to 4,300 kilograms per hectare. So is that physically possible on that land that we could increase her, the, life, the uh, annual forage production by that much? Probably not. So a second approach, if we want to keep that entire herd, is how many extra hectares are we going to need uh, if we have the same type of production potential across the ranch. So you go in, end up going through here and you can see we ended up having an excess grazing of 26 uh, acres available. So I had to raise the pasture size to 2,500 hectares in order to keep this herd. Another option then is we reduce the herd size. So we go back to the original uh, biomass produced, 2,500 uh, kilograms per hectare. 1,500 uh, is uh, forage. We look, so I ended up with 2.34 uh, negative hectares available. Again, really not significant. And in order to achieve that, what I had to do then was I had to remove all of my replacement cows, my sheep, my horses, and actually even reduce the animal numbers of mother cows. So instead of a hundred mother cows, I ended up with only 67. Uh, and so you can go through here and play different configurations, looking at this bottom number over here. And it'll tell you if you balanced your uh, resources and your herd uh, for a sustainable uh, stocking rate. I'll stop there and uh, we'll go back here and I'll just show you simply uh, how to utilize this. It's very simple. If we would take, this is our first example where we had cows and calves at 100. If we just put zero in there, you would see we, the bottom right-hand number, it goes to the parentheses, which is in Excel means a negative number. So we had 131.74 uh, extra hectares we would need then to keep the rest of this herd uh, fully fed uh, during this time period. So if we put this back to uh, 100, we have other options that we remove. Uh, as I showed, you can remove either your, your sheep, your rams. Uh, you can add uh, more forage. Uh, you could buy hay. Uh, there's a lot of ways of manipulating this spreadsheet then to tell you how to balance it out. Uh, you could forgo your drought mitigation 40% uh, and uh, just run the risks that if you have a drought, you're going to overgraze uh, or you're going to have to destock. Uh, and you can play all sorts of scenarios uh, for that particular ranch. 
I'll stop there. Are there any questions then on anything I've presented uh, to this point? So all of this material, including this updated spreadsheet is available. Uh, GoNAS can send you out uh, the information on where you can find it. Uh, not only is a spreadsheet there, but then there's a small document uh, that I produced and it shows you how to use each equation. Uh, so then you would know how to and what numbers you would put in here. Uh, and then the uh, additional resources uh, we made available then uh, were planting guides uh, from the northern tier of the United States and southern Canada. Uh, on type of plant species that we would plant then for degraded rangelands. Uh, we have uh, both cool season grasses and warm season grasses, our C4 grasses. Uh, those books and, and tells you how to plant them, uh, what their uh, estimated production rate is. There's also a uh, handout then from the northern tier of the United States then on poisonous plants. Some of those will be uh, common in Aknola. One poisonous plant that you may not be aware of are pine trees. When pregnant cows accidentally consume uh, pine needles uh, during their third stage of pregnancies, it can actually cause abortion. And so, uh, there's a book on poisonous plants, uh, and many of those will also be common in Akmola. Excess eat uh, consumption of oak, uh, acorns, and oak leaves, if on accident uh, during the grazing, can cause uh, adverse impact on the animal. Another plant that we saw uh, very common in uh, different areas of Kazakhstan is what we call the common name loco weed. Uh, that's an astragalus species uh, or species. And there are many astragalus species in the United States. There are also many astragalus species in Kazakhstan. They can become infected with an endophyte. Uh, and then that becomes very toxic to the livestock and can cause death. The reason we call it local weed is because the animal starts to act crazy. Uh, and uh, Oxytropus uh, is another plant that's very similar to uh, the local weed. And uh, it can be also infected by the endophyte and can cause toxicity in, in livestock. So that's in the poisonous plants book. Uh, and uh, hopefully those have value for you. Are there any questions then on using the spreadsheet or the rationale we use for setting up stocking rates and how we calculate it on a ranch basis? All of this assumes uh, that your pasture area is relatively uniform in the distribution and type of uh, vegetation produced. If your branch has differential uh, areas that have changes in slope or changes in soil, uh, those could result in different plant communities. And then what you'd end up having to do then is sample each one of those unique areas and estimate a stocking rate uh, for that unique area. And if you're using a herder, then you can adjust uh, how long you stay in that area uh, to graze based on its production potential. If you're fencing, you might want to try and fence those areas if it's logical and pragmatic into pastures that have more uniform production potential. It may not be possible 
to fence that out. You may not want to fence it uh, and continue using herders. And then a trained herder then could recognize differences in the plant community and would adjust how long he would allow uh, the animals to graze in that area uh, if there is differential production. We have about 15 minutes left in our time uh, for questions, if there's any questions. Mark, if there are no questions, I believe we can finish a little earlier this time. Uh, absolutely. That's what I was going to suggest. And so uh, next week then, uh, the final on this, we'll be trying to wrap it all up. Uh, and we'll be showing how to use a USDA tool called the Rangeland Hydrology Erosion Model, REM. Uh, and then we can put in uh, our cover values that we've been collecting or showing you how to collect to estimate then surface runoff <clears throat> that we might use then to design a stock bond uh, and also soil erosion. Uh, and if you're starting to have excess soil erosion, then that site is going to degrade and you'll lose production over time. So it's a different way of looking at sustainability uh, and it is quantitative. Uh, and we are using that approach in the United States. So uh, one last time we'll ask for questions. And if there are none, uh, I appreciate you uh, spending your evening with me. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking with you next Wednesday uh, and concluding and wrapping up this seminar series. And we hope it has value to you. That's all I have, Golnez. Thank you, Mark. And people are saying thank you to you in the chat. Now let me do this announcement in Russian too, some announcement, okay? Дорогие участники, благодарю за участие в семинаре. Если у вас будут какие-то еще дополнительные вопросы, вы можете написать мне на e-mail gulnaz.istakova.gmail.com. С этого e-mail вы получали ссылки на этот семинар. Спасибо большое. На следующей неделе у нас заключительный семинар. Будем вас ждать. Хорошего вечера.